The king of my heart be the mountain where I run. The fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide. The ransom from my life, oh, he is my song. You are good, good.
when the night is holding on to me. God is holding on. We got a change. I can't hear with these things in my ears. Let's try that again. Good morning. Good morning. Woo, yeah. Isn't it wonderful to be in God's house this morning? Welcome to First Christian Church. We're so glad that you're all here. If you're a visitor with us this morning, we have little different colored slips. I think a lot of them are yellow um, that you can fill out so we can know who you are. Um, and also, if you have a prayer request, we have an intercessory prayer group that meets on Thursdays. And you can write your prayer requests on those cards as well and put them in the baskets to the side or the one up front. And our prayer group will pray for your needs. Um, at this time, I'm looking for, there she is, right in front of my face. She's rolling her eyes at me. Um, Jillian's got some announcements. I wonder how she missed me. <laughs> Just saying. I have... I strike a pose. Okay, so good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, today, I would like to um, let you all know that because of the congregational meeting immediately following this service, the um, Sunday school class for the in-betweens, which is 30 to 50s, that will start next week. And then um, all of our Sunday schools for the wee little ones will as well. So please do send them our way or send you to the library next Sunday morning. Chip is somewhere. He'll wave in the corner. Chip, wave. There, see that arm? You'll follow that arm. Okay, good. Lee, 
telling you. Uh, you'll find that there are little slips of paper lingering around, some in the seats, some on the tables. Um, Alan's going to let you know what you can do with these later, but if you're looking for them, that's what these blank pieces of paper are for. As far as everything else, there are um, booklets in the back that tell you about all the new offerings. And did I forget anything? Next, um, the 26th, I know, Miriam. The 26th, we have um, Cooking with Kim. So if you would like to, join us that Thursday night at 6 o'clock. We're going to learn how to make summer rolls from scratch. And then finally, Miriam wants me to let you all know that Hope meets tomorrow at 11 here in the fellowship hall. So um, I, they're going to be getting busy making casseroles, doing all kinds of stuff. So do join us here. Um, other than that, I hope you get your praise and worship on in the most fabulous of ways. Yep, that's it. And I would probably be inviting you to do that now while I take anybody under eight with me. Yeah, let's all stand and give God our best and highest praise. Oh. A tree planted by the water, we never will run dry. So living water flowing through, God, we thirst for more of you. Fill our hearts and flood our souls with one desire. Just to know you and to make you know we lift your name on high. Shine light.
church have a plea to stand together in the name of unity to bring you honor funded by your hands we sing what body what spirit we arise one hope one faith we arise by your strength your power God, I give you what I can today. Scattered ashes that I put away. I lay it all at your and for all, once and for all, there is victory in the Savior's love, in the crimson flowing from the cross, pour over me, pour over me. Once and for all, once and for all, oh Lord, I lay it down, oh Lord, I lay it down, help me to lay it down, oh Lord, I lay it down. Where I die. 
How about now? I am so glad that there's not eight days in this week because I was so glad for Sunday to get here. I couldn't wait. How about y'all? <laughs> uh, last week was, I guess, football season, opening day. Well, today is National Church Day. So y'all give yourself a round of applause for being here for National Church Day. I won't take long, but Jacob, he, uh, he gets long-winded at the beginning. We want to make sure he gets enough time for his message, you know. Um, I'd like to talk first about the cross you saw, me and Michael Lee nailing some nails up here on the cross. Well, I'm inviting all the guys that are here to a men's Bible study at my shop on 4050 Horton Station Road. It's kind of what we're doing here with small groups at this church. And uh, if anybody's welcome, everybody's welcome to come, just let me know. That way we prepare food. Give a little, for instance, um, tomorrow we've got fresh trout donated from uh, Bert Hill, John Hill's son, and um, we've got some Wahoo caught yesterday, so we've got like a fish dinner, and uh, we just we just have a good time. Um, coleslaw made by Miss LaDonna, which everything, what time? Yeah, <laughs> it starts at 6 o'clock, and uh, you know, it, it's amazing, you know, you sit here and listen to things, and we all tell our stories, and, and uh, just communing with one another, you know, it's about being being that oneness, you know, having that oneness together and sharing the love with each other and passing on everybody's stories and, and uh, just getting to know each other just like you do with Christ. And that's what it's all about is getting to know Christ with one another. And uh, we, we just have a good time and fellowship and, and we open up the Word of God and, and uh, we might not, you know, live the way everything is said and done, but, but we strive to just like Christ because um, he lives within us. When he lives within us, he's in us, so we, we're all one. Um, but if anybody's got any burdens or anything like that, during the service, if you want to write them down, after service, if you'd like to go, just put them, put them on the nails on the cross or something, and a group of elders will pray for them all week long. We'll pull them down, and during the week, we'll pray for them and, uh, and just guard them at the end of the week, and Monday or next Sunday, we'll, we'll add some more to it and, and go further with it. But... um. Right now, I'd like to ask y'all if you ever heard of a, a Chinese bamboo tree it's grown over there in East Asia. It grows 90 feet tall. It takes five years for it to grow 90 feet tall. Within that five years, you have to water and nurture it. You have to go to it every day and pull the, the weeds away from it to, to help it grow. Well, in the last five, in the last year, it grows 90 feet tall within five weeks. Now, does that bamboo tree grow 90 feet tall in five years or five weeks? What I'm getting at here is that we cultivate our lives and we do things in our lives that takes time. And coming to Christ and walking with Christ, it's a daily struggle. It's a daily battle. We're all in a battle. We're all in a spiritual battle. And these spiritual battles that we go through, it takes one another. It takes a team. My mama told me, told somebody one time, it takes an army to raise a youngin. Well, this is the army. Right here was her army. You know, from this first service to the second service, they prayed for me in my life. And in my life, I, I'm starting to understand, do I get it right every day? No. I fall short of the glory of God every day. But now knowing and seeing what path he has us on, us as we, we as a community, we are the church. We are all one together to spread the gospel, to spread the word, to spread the love of Jesus Christ. And what I'm getting at is, is it's, it's a short time. Michael Lee in our Bible study, he said we live in a dash. And I was like, well, he's, it's a hurry, it's a hurry, it's a dash, it's a dash. And it meant so much to me to, whew, to understand what he was talking about. I was born in 1968. Well, in between on my head, my tombstone, it's going to say, Allen Hall, 1968, dash. And then it's going to have the other end. Miss, Miss Fulmer knows about that. And, uh, she was, my mama asked, I asked my mom about it. She said, well, David knows something about it. So anyway, it, it, it meant something to me that that dash is in between the beginning and our end of life. Well, in between that middle is where God shows up. God keeps us going. God gives us that breath. I won't keep us any longer, but um, there's a lot of things that I'd like to, to share with you, and, and time will come. John, thir John 13, 34. Y'all read it. That's a Bible study. Guys that are that like to come, y 
y'all read it, and when y'all get there to the shop tomorrow, or whenever y'all's time comes, just say, hey, I know what John 13, 34 says, and then follow up on 13, 35, because we are all disciples of Christ. We are going to be one together. Um, I won't keep you any longer, but let, let, us, let us pray today and, and think about the things that, uh, that God has us, has us to do in life. Let us pray. Oh, Father, you show up at all times. You've showed up here today. I thank you for the things that you've done. There's three things in our lives that we know that, that never forsakes us. God, Father, and the Holy Spirit will always be beside us, no matter what. We strive so hard to be some things that we don't wish to be. But now, Lord, you've showed up in our lives today because we're here. We're here to, to catch that one word, to catch that one thing. No matter what is going through our lives, you can make it right. Lord, we thank you for the past, the present, and the future. The past being lessons learned. The present being a gift that you've given to us right now. And the future being the motivation for us to move forward in life. To strive in the places and the things that you'd have us to do. Lord, no matter what we're going through, we always look up to you and say thank you. Lord, you teach us so many things. Sometimes we don't listen. Sometimes we do. But Lord, let us be your hands and feet throughout this community, throughout the oneness of this world. Because we live a short time. James says it's like a vapor. We're here today and gone tomorrow. And Lord, we've lost loved ones. We've lost friends. But we know that eternal life is where it's at. That's what we strive to be, is having the eternal life, the gift that you've given us. All we have to do is walk the way that you've provided for us. Love one another as you first loved us. Before we were born, you loved us. And we thank you for that. And right now, Lord, we just thank you for the prayer that you've taught us to pray. As we say together, our Father, who art in heaven, Right now, I'd like to ask the elders and the deacons to come up for communion. Um, what are coming up? This is the sacrifice that Christ made for us, laying it down. We just heard the song from the Praise Water Band, Lay It Down. This is what we have to do. We have to lay our lives down for one another and for, for ourselves. Sometimes you can't fix things until you fix yourself. And, uh, that's what I learned. I wanted to help others, but I couldn't help others until I helped myself, until I understood what things were. And uh, Christ did that. He showed us. He was the model. He was the living Christ. And, uh, the living word. He's not dead. He rose again on the third day. He defeated what most people thought as, as a crucial thing, but it wasn't. It was a glorified thing. And Lord God, I can't wait to get my glorified body. Whew. <laughs> <laughs> aching pains oh my god but anyway um, I'm going to turn it over to the elders will you pray with me Father God you sent your son to live among us and he walked as we walked this earth but he walked without blame 
The one thing he taught us was that we're to love each other unconditionally. That's a hard thing for us to do. It's a hard thing for us to even grasp. But he taught us about a love for each other that, that transcends any, any differences that we have. As we take this cup and we eat the bread, help us to remember, Father God, that we come to this table one body and one spirit and that we lay our, our blames at your feet. We lay everything that we have at your feet. And we know that you don't love us any more on our very best days than you do on our very worst day. Help us to know, Father, that no matter where we are, what we do, that you love us with a boundless love. And help us, Father, to duplicate that love for each other. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Forty years ago, as a young deacon, there was one passage that I started with when I went out to the nursing homes to give communion. And that passage was from the book of Luke. So for over 40 years, he has prepared me for this moment. But when the time has come, Christ sat down with him and said to his apostles, with great desire, I desire to eat this Passover with you, but I shall not until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of heaven. And he took the bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Then after dinner, in like manner, he took the cup, and you can almost feel the hesitation and the depth of what he's getting ready to say. He said, this is the new covenant in my blood, even that which is poured out for you. This do in remembrance of me. Words of God for the people of God.
Jesus, friend of sinners, may we have strength to follow away. You cut down people in your name, but the sword was never ours to sway. And Jesus, friend of sinners, the truth's become so hard to see. The world is on their way to you, but they're tripping over me. Always looking around, but never looking up. I'm so double-minded. A plank-eyed saint with dirty hands and a heart divided. Oh, Jesus, friend of sinners, open our eyes to the world at the end of our pointing fingers. And let our hearts be led by mercy help us reach with open hearts and open doors oh jesus friend of sinners and break our hearts for what breaks yours friend of sinners, the one who's riding in the sand, may the righteous turn away and the stones fall from their hands. Help us to remember we are all the least of these. Let the memory of your mercy bring your people to their knees. Nobody knows what we're for, only what we're against when we judge the wounded if we put down our signs cross over the lines and love like you did oh jesus friend of sinners open our eyes to the world at the end of our pointing fingers let our hearts be led by Every week, they never disappoint, do they?
Y'all can go ahead. I know you want to. Some of you are just, you can do it right out loud. How about Alan Hall? My goodness. We have, we must have. I know every church probably thinks so, but we're right. They're not right. We have the best ministers on the planet, don't we? Who are our ministers? Look around. You are our ministers. You are God's servants. We are a priesthood of all believers. What does that mean? There was, for a long time, I thought that meant that really there were no priests, that Jesus is the only priest. But what we've been seeing recently is that we really are all priests. We all have the opportunity to mediate God's presence and God's love to one another, don't we? We all mediate God's presence, don't we? You mediate God's presence to me. I hope I mediate God's presence to you. And when we come together as a community of faith, God's presence is magnified in a way that truly is extraordinary. We can experience God, and we do experience God in so many ways. In our daily lives, moment to moment, if we pause and remember with the various circumstances that we're facing, if we can just take a minute and pause, we can experience a new God's presence. But this time that we have together is something special. When people intentionally gather in the presence of one another for the purpose of drawing closer to God, God shows up in an extraordinary, extraordinary way, in the kind of way that we can't experience God in any other way. So I want to thank you, ministers, for your ministry of presence. I hope it never sounds rote. I know I say some things and I repeat some things on somewhat of a regular basis, but I mean this now. This service would not be the same if you were not here this morning. You are here by divine appointment. And as we are going to see throughout this message, your appointment has several reasons that you're here. One is because it affects all of us collectively. Another reason is because we can experience God in a unique and powerful way. But the other is that God can speak one word to us that can change everything about our lives. It can change the complete trajectory of our lives. Sometimes we're going in one direction and we can hear one word from God that can send us in a completely different trajectory. How many of you have ever experienced that, what I'm talking about? You thought you were going one way. You had made your plans to go one way. And then, thank God, God interrupted your plans and sent you in another direction. The fact that I am standing here at this moment is a testament to that reality. Now, when I say one word, sometimes God speaks to us in literally one word. But when I speak of a word, I mean that can mean a message, it can be a direction, it can be a wisdom, it can be the solution to a challenge we've had in our lives. A word is God's communication with us, and sometimes that word actually transcends words. Are you with me? That word can transcend language, and yet it's still a word from God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh. All things came into being through the word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. What do we mean by Word? So much more than we can get our minds around. Sometimes we think of the Word as logos, as wisdom, as God's will, God's plan. God's will for us personally, God's will for this church, the wisdom, the way. And if we will open ourselves up, God desires to disclose God's word to us on an ongoing basis. One of the ways that we understand God's word is through the words of what? Scripture, the Bible. So with that in mind, I invite you to turn to the passages that we read last week. 
I'm going to pause on a couple of occasions and see how well we were paying attention last week, for those of you who were here. Now, Alan came out and said he was speaking because I get out here and get too long-winded. But now that we have time, I can preach the sermon from last week and this week since we're doing these passages. You know better than that. What did we, we went to 10, 20 last week, I think. We broke a new record for long-windedness. I won't do that this week. But what I will pray is this, as I did last week. Whatever is merely from me, we will forget before we leave this place this morning. Whatever is from God will be indelibly imprinted on our hearts, minds, and spirits. Can that be our prayer together? So let's together say amen. amen. So let's look at these words of Scripture. The psalmist says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. Do we have the courage this morning to say, Search me, O God, and know my heart? We think we do, but do we really? Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me, lead me in the way everlasting. What does that word wicked mean? Remember we saw that last week? How many of you just love to come across that word wicked? Not many of us. Not so. What does that word mean, wicked? I love that we can reinterpret words more approximately. Some on, some of you were listening, someone remembers, some of you even write, wrote it down. Hurtful. hurtful. That word wicked means hurtful. What else? Evil is a way of understanding it, but evil we think of in a lot of ways, so hurtful helps us to get at the nature of evil, doesn't it? What else do we understand by wicked? Not according to God's plan. That's right. That's good. Now we're, we, are, we are. We are discerning now. What does discernment mean? To separate apart that which is true from that which is untrue. To get closer to the meaning and the will and the intent of God. So we have, what did we say, hurtful, evil, that which is contrary to the will of God. What else? Causes suffering. Causes suffering. That's important. Now, how many of you, before this was clarified, when you heard the word wicked, thought of it primarily in terms of causing someone to su suffer or hurting someone? Is that what came to mind? We, used to, we probably thought of wicked as some abstract something. We didn't think of it as interpersonal, did we? We thought of it as a sinfulness, generally speaking. But I love that Alex said it's contrary to the will of God because the will of God is always personal. The will of God is always personal. That which we do which is contrary to God's will is always hurtful. It's injurious. It causes suffering in ourselves and other people. So let's read it again. So if there's any injurious, hurtful, one way of translating it is offensive, way in me, lead me in the way everlasting. Let's let that be our prayer along with the psalmist. Now let's look at this next passage because this is where the rubber meets the road. This is one of those difficult passages, but if we can grasp it, this is a word that can change everything. Until we get the order straight, we're out of order. When we get this order correct, everything then begins to fall in place. When we get intentional about following this way, now we are on the right way. So let's look at it together. It's familiar, but let's read it together. Now large crowds were traveling with him. That's a big statement. He has healed. He has taught. He's performed miracles. He's responded to the needs of people who could not get those needs met on their own. That describes all of us, doesn't it? And now there's a large crowd 
large crowds were traveling with him. And he turned to them and said, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife, children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself, cannot be my disciple, my follower. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost? to see whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot, then while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore... Not one of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions and follow me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now that one's a strained one, isn't it? If you are not willing to hate father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, if he means that the way we think he means that, that's probably a deal breaker for all of us, isn't it? How many of you are ready to hate your spouse? I heard that actually echo in my head. I hope that's not true, but sometimes we... If we are people rooted in love, then none of us are ready to do that. How many of us are ready to hate those closest to us? Let's put it that way. We're not, and there's no way that's what that means. We saw last week, because some of you are here for the first time this week, some of you for the first time ever, some of you were traveling in a way. But we need to know what he means by hate. What does he mean by that? Is this hyperbole? Yes, it is. But it's also a matter of Arabic Arabic language. Arabic language is always spoken in the absolute. What do we mean by that? In the same way that we partially like someone, but we have a different kind of relationship with those who are closest to us. There's actually only one word in that language, and it would be love. In the same way, to say any form of approximation, they're contrasted dualistically, unfortunately. Like either it's this or it's that, which is not the case. What he's saying here, there has to be One is the priority. It doesn't mean that you actually hate a spouse or hate your children or hate anyone or hate your own life. You see that contrasted pretty regularly even in Jesus' language. You cannot serve two masters. You will hate the one and love the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon, money. It's not saying that you're actually supposed to hate money. It means that one receives the priority. Are you with me? But there is no easy way to translate that into English. But it does jolt us, doesn't it? It it gets our attention, and that is something. That's the reason part of this is in hyperbole, because it does need to get our attention. And what we saw last week, and, and this sounds simplistic, but there's a whole understanding behind this that is anything but simplistic. But I'm going to say it this simply so that we can understand it. Because not everything that is simple is simplistic. Are you with me? A simplistic statement is one that doesn't actually carry much meaning. It's what we've referred to as a platitude, where someone can make a statement and they have no idea what it means. But it sounds good. A simple statement on the other side of simplicity is one that gets at the essence of something. And I'm getting ready to say something that sounds so very simplistic, but it is anything but. This is at the heart and the core of my theology, how I understand God, how I believe in God, my deep convictions about God. God is love. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus embodies the very presence of God. If God is love, Jesus embodies the very presence of love. So where this statement makes perfect sense is if God is love, properly understood, God is the reality of love beyond that word love. Some of us tire of the word love, but we never tire of the reality of love. For some of us, we have different associations with that word love. But there is a reality of love that transcends the word love. And that reality is the ultimate, highest, 
eternal reality. So now I'm going to go back to the simple statement. God is love. Jesus is love embodied. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God except through Jesus. So if God is love and Jesus is the Son of God and Jesus is the embodiment of God, then love is the way, the truth, and the life. Do we agree so far? And so he can make this statement because unless you know love, you're not loving your spouse. Unless you know love properly understood, you're not loving your children. Unless you know love properly understood, you're not loving. Whatever your concept, whatever your thought about what love is, that is not the reality of love, prevents you from fulfilling the very commandment he gave us. So it wouldn't make sense to say what is the greatest commandment when the lawyer came and tested him. What, what was the greatest commandment? You know it. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And what's the second one? Love your neighbor as yourself. And then he gave a new commandment. Love one another how? As I have loved you. Unconditionally, sacrificially. So what he's saying is, until you follow me, you can't love with the kind of love that fulfills this commandment. Is this satisfied in your mind, or do we need to go through this again? And we will, because it's too important not to. Are we good? Do you, are you with me? Is everybody with me? Okay. So we are all going in a direction, whether we recognize it or not. I've been thinking about this, and I wondered if there was any neutrality. Either we are going in the way of the one, or we're going in the way that's contrary. Now, I've been praying about this. I invite you to come talk to me about it, but this is the way I see it right now. Either we are going in the way of the one, or we are in the way of the one. How many of you want to go in the way of the one? And so now we have to ask ourselves very, very seriously. I have a sense that the next statement I'm getting ready to make may be the most important statement I've made since I've been here. If we say that we want to follow the one, then we want to be extremely careful about how we go about it. How do you know you are following the one? If this has eternal significance, if this is the most important matter you can settle in your life, we want to get it right, don't we? Yes, we do. And so one of the things we can do is pray the prayer of the psalmist. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. Let's make that our prayer again in light of recognition of the stakes being so very high, right? This is no simple matter. This is no small matter, is it? Because if we're not on the way of Jesus, then what are we doing to ourselves? What are we doing to those closest to us? If we're not on the way, not only are we neutral, we're in the way, then we need to take seriously getting on the way. <clears throat> so how do we know? One is through that disposition of the heart. God, show me. God, I lay it down. Whatever would prevent me from following along the way. My pride, my hubris, my fear. And we're going to see some others in just a moment about what we can lay down. As part of the Christian church, Disciples of Christ, and I want to say this as quickly as I know how to, we live in a post-denominational age. I'm guessing that half of you are here and you could not care less about whether this is Methodist, Presbyterian, Disciples, Baptist. We live in a post-denominational age. For those of who grew up in a denomination, that can seem scary. In some ways, I think that's something to celebrate because God only ever intended, what, one church. 
But I can tell you a little bit about our denomination and part of the reason that I became a part of it. I don't believe these things because I'm a disciples minister. I'm a disciples minister because I wholeheartedly embrace these things. Our denomination was founded on unity, oneness. There was a revival, and there were Methodists and Presbyterians and others who had gathered. And the Holy Spirit was experienced in a way that was extraordinary. The Holy Spirit is always with us, but sometimes the Holy Spirit can stir you up in ways that are extraordinary. And on this particular event... There was a sense of unity and oneness. And some of the founders of this denomination realized that creeds in themselves could be a hindrance to the oneness of God because we see things differently. Sometimes we read Scripture differently. Can you believe they read Scripture differently 200 years ago? There are some things that some people emphasize and some things that other, people's don't, other people don't, but they emphasize something else. So there was this statement that's common to some denominations and certainly common to ours. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty, freedom. In all things, charity, love. We were and are a movement for oneness in a fragmented world. That's very central to how we understand ourselves. So what happened was, was they created a statement of faith that was supposed to remove all obstacles to people becoming a part of the church, the one body of Christ. There are no creeds. You don't have to recite the Nicene Creed or the Apostles' Creed or the Westminster Confession. This is no intellectual aptitude. This is not not an orthodoxy that you have to believe so that you can become a part of the church. So they said, this is the requirement. It was meant to... Clear the way so that people could be a part of the one body of Christ. And that confession of faith is we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and we proclaim him as Lord and Savior, or some variation thereof. It was meant to be simple, but not simplistic. So one of the things we have to do if we want to follow the one on his way is understand that statement. Now, many of you in this room have made that statement. Most of you have made that statement. And so one of the things that we can do to understand how to follow him on that way is to understand what that statement means in the first place. So let's look at that piece by piece. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. We proclaim him as Savior and Lord. Now, very quickly, because we did this last week, but this is important. How many of you know it's possible, and there's always a shadow side to any time you make a positive move in a positive direction, and this would be it? How many of you know that some people can say, now listen, all you have to do to be a member of the church is make a confession of faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and proclaim him as Lord and Savior. What, that can, ha- what can happen as a result of that is that then becomes a formula, almost like a superstition. Have you made that confession of faith or not? It becomes in people's mind. Have you made that confession of faith or not? Because either you have or you haven't. And if you have, then you're in. If you haven't, you're out. If you follow it to its log- logical conclusion. Is everybody with me? But it could be possible that you could have made that confession. Let's say, hypothetically, you were, you were dedicated when you were about a year old in the church. And then you went through a pastor's class, is probably what it was called. And then you decided on Palm Sunday to make your confession of faith along with 15 other 13-year-olds. And then you were back. I'm not knocking it. I'm just saying about the possibility. If it becomes formulaic. So you've made your confession of faith, now you're baptized, and your whole life, now you're 85, 90 years old, and now it is a requirement. In order to be a part of the church, you have to make a confession of faith. Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God, we proclaim as Lord and Savior. And it is possible to have no idea what that means. So are we on the way or not? Are we on the way of following Jesus or aren't we? It's possible that we're not. And now it's possible that we're excluding all these people who desperately want to be on the way, desperately need to be on the way, but they don't know if they're ready to make that confession of faith. Ironically, they may know more about what that confession of faith means than the one who's been confessing it for 80 years. So if we want to be on the way, let's get this statement of faith more internalized. Because it's a statement of faith that we will grow for the rest of our lives in understanding. What does Jesus mean? What does Jesus mean? There are a number of different translations. It is very close to the Hebrew word, Hebrew name Joshua. 
It's sometimes translated, God is salvation. God is salvation. I'm not going to ask us to raise our hands, but how many of us knew that? Don't raise your hand. How many of us, is it possible we've been Christians our whole lives and we didn't know that? God is salvation. There's another way of understanding it. Now, that's passive. God is salvation. There's another way of understanding it. God saves. God rescues. I like that one better. God is active. God is pursuing you. God was pursuing you before you even knew it. God was pursuing you before you ever had an idea of God. God is always taking the, the initiative. God is the active one in this relationship. God is the primary actor in this relationship. God rescues. The angel Gabriel gave Mary the name that that supernatural child was to be given Jesus. God saves, God rescues, God delivers. Is the Christ, the anointed one, what is the anointed one? The Christ, that's what that means, anointed one. What does it mean to be anointed one? The one in whom, through whom, upon whom the Spirit dwells. The one that led Jesus, the Holy Spirit. Some of us don't agree and don't worry. You're not prevented from becoming a member of this church if we disagree on this matter. Some of us are Trinitarian. I happen to be one. I believe in God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Not everyone does. For me, they are three in one. The way I, under, I came to understand that, it was interesting because after I had had, first had my conversion experience that was very atypical, I was trying to sort this out. And I, of all things, I don't know why, because God led it, I'm sure. I sent a letter to a monastery in Conyers, Georgia. And a person who was there responded, one of the priests who lives a life devoted to prayer and contemplation for other people, contemplation for the presence of God and prayer and supplication for other people, he sent something back, and I'd never heard of it until that point, but the triune God, I like that. Triune, T-R-I-U-N-E, triune. What does that mean? Three in one. We're beginning to get a sense of who God is. Are you... Are you I know I keep saying this, but you'll see why in a moment. Why I keep saying, are you with me? But are you with me? If you're with me, say amen. amen. Okay. So, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, in whom, through whom, upon whom, the Anointed One, leads Jesus into the wilderness, and so forth and so on. For time's sake, I don't have a chance to say that, but that's what it means to be the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Son. Now, this is what I love. Now, when I say, are you with me, there was and is a minister in a town not much bigger than this one. He does not, did not have the privilege of a formal theological education, but he was called to ministry, and no one can doubt it. Different ministers are called to different people to relate people in a different way, but it's the same God who inspires it all, right? So he is an electrician by trade, by training, by vocation, his profession, which is another statement. Whatever we do is a profession of what we believe. Do you know that? That's where professional came. What is your profession? Because it is an extension of what you've been called to do. We're all ministers, remember, both within and beyond the church. He's an electrician. But he said something that gave me such a beautiful insight into the nature of the relationship between God the Father, God the Son. This particular electrician, his father is an electrician. He grew up watching and doing everything his father did. Early on, when he became a professional electrician, sometimes his father would send him to a job site. And when he would get to that job site, because he was younger, people would complain because they wanted the father. What they didn't realize was that to send the son was the same thing as sending the father. Because all that the father had, had been given to the son. The wisdom of the son was the wisdom of the father. The skill of the son was the skill of the father. To watch the son in action would have been to watch the father's actions. Are you with me? Now the reason I keep saying are you with me, and I realize I've only heard him speak a couple of times, but where I'm from... There's a dialect that many of you wouldn't even understand. <laughs> he was a great teacher and is a great teacher, but he'd get so far and he'd say, you know what I'm saying? 
You know what I'm saying? He'd get excited, and he wasn't, it wasn't just that. He was serious. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? You don't know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? I need to repeat it. So now I say, are you with me? Are you following me? You know what I'm saying? All right. The son of the living God. God is alive and well today and still speaking to us. God still speaks to you and to me. God can send our lives on a different trajectory. God can change the way we see everything. God can change our jobs. God can change the way we view church. God can view, change the way we view God. God can change the way we view ourselves. God can change the way we view others. A word from God can change everything, and God is still speaking. Lord and Savior. Lord means that he's the supreme authority. I don't have too much time with this, but he is the supreme authority. But this is the thing. If we're going the way, we need to get this about Jesus because Jesus is the way. He is the way. And so we need to understand these fundamentals. To say Lord is not a title, it's not just a status. The one with the highest status took the lowest status so that all could be raised to the highest status. Every person in this room has the highest status. You are a child of God. The one who was divine became human, not just human, took the lowest possible status in the statuses of humanity so that the lowest possible status of humanity becomes the highest possible status. That's what it means. He is Lord. He flips status on its head in the way that we normally think of it. He is Lord. He is the authority. He is the supreme authority. But in a way that's paradoxical because he'll never enforce it on you. See, that's what makes it the greatest authority. That's what makes it the greatest power in the world is that he can woo you without coercing you. He can bring you to your knees where you say, Jesus is Lord. I want him. I want to go his way. Why? Because he loves you more than you can imagine. You're not doing it because you have to or because you're afraid of the alternative. Once you recognize how much he loves you, you say, he is Lord. It's not a doctrinal statement that we have to make so that we get to go to heaven one day. It's a recognition of the reality that he really is Lord. And when we get that reality, we don't want any other reality. He's Lord and he's our Savior. And when we get to that, when we understand that, he saves us. He saves us and he continues to save us. And as I say on occasion, it always just gets better. Long way to go and about five minutes to get there. <laughs> it's always the way of cross. What's holding us back? We need to get to this because we didn't get to it last week. What holds us back? Misplaced loyalties. Misplaced loyalties. Now, what I'm getting ready to say is very, very difficult because he understood what he was saying when he said, count the cost. Are you ready for this? And some of us say, I'm ready, Lord, until we... You remember Mike Tyson? There was a statement about opponents of his. You remember, he used to be scary. Yeah, in some ways. But they used to say about Mike Tyson, every opponent of his has a plan until they get hit. <laughs> then their plan goes by the wayside. Oh, no. The same with us. Most of us think, I'm ready. I have decided to follow Jesus until we're faced with something. Now, I don't mean to trivialize that song. That's a powerful song if you listen to it. But some of us sing it that way, though. That's a serious song. Have we decided to follow Jesus? Some of us until we get hit. We had a plan, and then we got hit. And then we realized, wait a minute, this may cost me something. Now, I'm serious about this. This is tough. He knew what he was saying. If you follow the way of love, and that's what we said it is, right? God is love. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is love. Love is the way, the truth, and life. If you decide to follow this way, and make no mistake, this is what it is. How many of you know not everybody's going to go that way? See, being reconciled to God means being reconciled to God's ways. God's way is the way of reconciliation. Not everyone is reconciled to reconciliation. Therefore, we can't be reconciled to the way of other people who are not going this way. 
I said that quickly, but I hope you followed me. Doesn't mean everything goes. Anything goes. That's where I think some people get afraid. We start talking about the inclusive love of God. They think, well, anything's going. They just let anything happen. No, 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 we won't. Anything that violates the dignity of another will not be tolerated. Anything that disrespects another child of God will not be tolerated. Anything that violates the freedom of another person to live as faithfully as they know how, interpreting their Bible as faithfully as they know how, will not be tolerated. Anything that treats one person as inferior to another will not be tolerated. Any injustice to another will not be tolerated. You see, to be reconciled to God means to be reconciled to reconciliation. And reconciliation requires freedom, equality, justice, dignity, and respect. It doesn't mean anything goes. Now, sometimes we are finite beings and we don't always know or agree on a particular matter. But we'll still treat one another with freedom, equality, justice, dignity, respect. Now... There are some people who say, you know, I can't go that way. I'm not going that way. This is the most difficult one. I thank God, I'm sorry to do this, Valerie. I thank God that Valerie's on this way. Because guess what? If she were on this way and I was not on this way, she has a God-given responsibility to go this way. See, now it's getting serious, isn't it? What if God says on this way, you know, I know you thought that what you were pursuing was successful, but that's a world's definition of success. I've not called you to acquire more. I've called you to give up more. You with me? So he says you have to be willing to give up all your possessions. Now some of us say it's hyperbole. Yes, it is. But let our minds go to something we're attached to. Would we give that up? Going on this way? Now here's the part. This is grace. It's an unconditional, unmerited gift of God's love. Grace is absolute forgiveness, but it's also the power to do what God has called us to do. It's not just forgiveness. It's the power to do what God has called us to do. I think sometimes there are misplaced loyalties. Sometimes it's self-preservation. Now, I've said this, and this is important. Most of us think we operate out of the moral, what is right and good. If we're not careful, we actually operate out of the consequential. What does that mean? For some of us, we're actually led by where the consequence of this action will lead us in terms of how it will affect me personally, rather than is this the good and right way to go, the will of God, if we're not careful. So one of the things we have to do is take a step back and say, God, what do I have invested in this that's causing me to interpret your will in a particular way. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts on this particular matter. Sometimes we're thinking about how this will affect me before I'm going to go this way. When we have to ask the question primarily and first and foremost, what is your way, God? And then attachments. And we talked about that. I have my attachments. You have yours. And sometimes I have to give them to God. If God gives it back, then I know it's from God. But we have to be honest about that. Do you know what I mean when I say that? We give it to God. Do you do? We give it to God and honestly say, God, it is yours. If God gives it back, it's yours. And it doesn't always mean forever, by the way. It means for now. We'll talk more about that in weeks to come. We've already talked about what one means. What does this one mean? We've been talking a lot about one, the one word. Well, actually, one word came to us, and you know what that one word was? Yes, it includes that, but a way of communicating the message of Jesus in one word. And we've been saying love, but now it's another word. It's on my shirt. One. The one word Jesus gave us was one, as it turns out. What is our one agenda? That we would be one. And so we recognize that is the way, and I believe with my whole heart. I've been looking at this, and this is what we need to understand, and I promise you I'm closing soon. This is what I need you to understand. For some of you, you think one is about a particular thing. And the reason I stated it this way in the outline is it is about much less and so much more than you may possibly know. See, when we get this one way straight, we recognize that Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God, the community of God. The will of God. That's what we're talking about. What is the will of God? That we would be one. What did Jesus pray? 
that we may be one. It's written on the back of my shirt. That's Jesus' prayer, that we would be one. What I've recognized is this is actually what saves the world. It's actually what saves my life. It's actually what saves my relationships. When we get this, when we get, and these are not just abstract principles, when we get through the relationships, freedom, equality, justice, dignity, and respect, it affects every area of life. The economy, politics, international affairs, all those controversial matters that we've been talking about, how I spend my money, what I choose to consume, who I choose to vote for, if I choose to vote. Do you see this affects every area of your life? It affects the way we treat our most significant others. Are we treating them with dignity and respect, with freedom, equality, and justice? Let me ask you this. Don't raise your hand. Please. Let me give you just an example that came to mind. How many of us who are in, oftentimes, in, in a relationship, if we have to be in a relationship, a significant relationship, where there's a man and a woman in that relationship, and we happen to be going somewhere, and we take the woman's car, <laughs> who drives? If we happen to be going somewhere, and we go in the woman's car, who drives? A lot of times a man. Why? Do men drive better than women? Do we have some inherent ability to drive better than women? You thought it meant that particular thing. Now you begin to see, search me, O oh God, know my heart. Have we set up hierarchical structures, structures in place we're not even paying attention to? You're with me. I'm not even asking now because it's getting quiet in here. <laughs> All right, I'm done. Here's the thing. This is what I want to know. This is what I'm saying. This is what it's about. He hears me. This is what it's about. This is what I can tell you. This is what I can tell you because I know that I know him, I know her. And the reason I know him, I know, I know that I know him, I know her is because I ask. You can ask the question, Jesus, are you the one? If you ask that question and you mean it, I believe Jesus will show up as it pleases Jesus to come, and you can trust that he will. You can trust him. Jesus is the one. I have decided, you have decided, we have decided to go the way of the one. Not just to go the way of one, but go the way of the one. That's what I meant. Your whole life can change. For some of us, we were wanting to go the way of one, but the way it can come into focus is we're going the way of the one. Make no mistake. Jesus is at once a particular and the universal. He's a particular person in whom God chose to reveal God's very nature, and his message is one of universal love, and we will grow in our understanding of it. Jesus' prayer is that we would be one. My prayer for us this morning is that we will not fear this direction in the sense that it is a path that's taking us off track. When I believe with my whole heart, if we're on any other track, we're on the wrong road. I heard a theologian say it this way one time, and this is something that I think is liberating and relief to all of us. Salvation is not about having reached the destination. There's not a person in this room who has reached the destination. Salvation is about being on the right road. The right road is the way of Jesus. The right road is the way of the cross. It's the way of forgiveness. It's the way of grace. It's the way of unconditional love. It's the way of hope. It's the way of healing. It's the way of making of this world the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven the family of God on earth as it is in heaven. It's the way of the one. My prayer is that God will search my heart, search my mind, show me where I'm not on that path. Lead me 
in the way of your son. Lead me in the way of the one. Amen. If there's anyone here who has never made a confession of faith, it is a recognition, it is an inkling. You don't have to know what that fully means. If you didn't know what any of those words meant that we talked about when we said Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, we proclaim him as Lord and Savior. If you didn't know what any of them meant, but now you're beginning to and you say, that's the way, I want to follow that one, come on forward, make that statement, and we will celebrate with you. There's a person who is not a member of a community of faith. We are a community of faith who is dedicated, dedicated, committed to following the one and we will learn together more and more about what that means. If there's anyone here who says, you know what, I made that confession of faith a long time ago. I didn't know what it meant at the time, but I want to come back and rededicate my life because now I know what it means. And I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. We invite you to come rededicate your life. If there's someone who is thinking, you know, I'd like to be baptized. Maybe I've never been baptized. Maybe I was baptized at a different time. You don't have to be rebaptized, been baptized, but... Some people say, you know what, I want to be baptized into the one body of Christ. I understand what that means now. If you have another prayer that you would like answered, if you need someone to pray with you, I invite you to come over here to the cross. We'll have a couple of elders there that would be willing to pray with you. I would like to remind those of you who are members, as strange as that is sounding to me more and more lately, those of you who are members, there's an identity statement that is going to be voted upon, which simply means in some very intentional language that we are on the path to oneness and all that that means. For those of you who are members after this service, I invite you to come to these rows and then you'll have an opportunity to vote your conscience and that's all we ask you to do on that statement. I invite you to stand as you're able as we respond as God is calling us to respond.
And now may the love of God that surpasses all understanding, all comprehension, the love that brought us here this morning, the love that is the inspiration behind the tears that are streaming down my face, the love that will never, ever let us go. May that love guard and sustain our hearts this day and forevermore. Amen.